It's the last full day until the NBA trade deadline. One of the biggest storylines to monitor for the Pacers from their salary cap space to which back up big they could move to other players that could be on the move. We'll talk about all that today on Locked on Pacers as well as a preview of the Pacers' final pre-deadline game in Miami against the Heat all coming today on the Locked on Pacers podcast. You are Locked on Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in to another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers as always. My name's Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and SI, and today it's trade deadline week. We're continuing to dive in to all things Pacers trade deadline, and if you're a reader as well, I have a pretty expansive-ish story up on Forbes about the upcoming deadline for the Pacers, the tightrope they're on. With both sides kind of pushing towards them of you started off the season really well. At the same time, you have this long-term approach. How does that work for the Pacers at the trade deadline? That and many other storylines will be the topics of today's podcast, right? Lots of stuff that could be worth monitoring for the Pacers at this deadline. Their backup bigs, their depth at guard, uh, their draft picks in the coming draft, their cap space. Will their actions or words end up winning out? All sorts of things that I think will be noteworthy in the next Whatever this turns out to be, 36 hours, depends on when you're listening. Trade deadline is at 3 p.m. Eastern on Thursday. Today's Wednesday when you're hearing this. So lots to cover today, and we'll talk about the heat at the end of this because the Pacers play in Miami for the final time of the season tonight. I highly recommend that Forbes story because all the Pritchard quotes you'll hear me recite today are typed out in it, uh, and it's a good way to just digest them. If you want to hear more of what he had to say, we talked to Kevin Pritchard in a media scrum about Miles Turner, the trade deadline, the state of this team and stuff at Miles Turner's extension press conference in a, in a media scrum after the actual presser. Uh, so there's more there from him if you want to read it. But to start off, I think the biggest thing, and this is the most disgusting thing to me at, when I talk to other people, not in the league, but just like people who are interested in the team is, what are the Pacers going to do with their backup bigs? I would consider that the most, to me especially, fascinating storyline hanging into this trade deadline for the Indiana Pacers. And this has kind of been a thing for them forever with having too many bigs, but this time it was kind of a group that they they approached the right way, I think, and then things kept changing in a way that kept making them add to the mix, right? They get Daniel Tice because they need the salary in the Brogdon trade, but he's still on their team, right? They re-signed Jalen Smith because he was awesome for them. They should have done that. They drafted Isaiah Jackson because they thought they might need another big last year because that was before they had Jalen Smith. They should have done that. He looks good. They drafted Batadze when they thought they needed a depth big. Okay. They extended Miles Turner after he was receptive to it and played very well with his team. Like, you look at all the bigs on this roster, even Terry Taylor's a center who popped for them as a rookie. Like, every guy they have in their big man rotation at the time of signing him uh, or extending him or whatever contractual agreement was made, It made sense for the Pacers to acquire said player, but then everything that happened kind of since then in this season has been like, oh, there's, there's too many of these guys, right? You know, they can't play all of it. Now that Turner is for sure in the mix with his extension, it's like, there's just not enough minutes to go around for all these guys. So how do they sort that out? Can they sort it out in a way that's productive for them this year, long-term, whatever? It's tricky, right? There's a lot of ways you could think about it because you know, if they want to be better sooner, maybe they value Tice more because he's this veteran. They've been playing him the last couple of games. It's kind of shown that he's a good screen setter and defender. They drafted Isaiah Jackson. They traded stuff up in the draft to get him, right? That certainly seems like a guy they value. They promised Jalen Smith a starting spot, gave him a deal with a player option. All this stuff that suggests that they have high value placed on those guys and have good reason to keep them. You could make an argument for any one of them, presumably depending on who you think is the best or who you think has the highest long-term ceiling, whatever. Um, But how do they sort all this out, right? And so I think there are a couple ways to look at it. First of all, Goga Batadze, I kind of view separately from the Tice, Smith, Jackson trio. Those three guys are at least in the mix for minutes every game. Goga's in a separate situation where I feel like it's best for him and the Pacers to find another home for Batadze where he could play or just be in the mix for minutes because that's not happening here. And a disservice to both him and the Pacers. It's a, it's a poor roster spot usage to have, you know, a sixth big who's not playing. I feel like it's better for both parties if that marriage ends. But 
you know, I understand that if they move two other bigs in separate moves, all of a sudden Batadze becomes more important to them. Either way, he's one of those guys in the mix. The other three, there's a lot of ways you could look at it. You could look at it as maybe you think they should trade Tice because he's the veteran and he doesn't fit their timeline and all those sorts of things. And before the season, that was certainly thought. I even probably said that several times. Uh, now they're better than they thought, maybe on an accelerated timeline, whatever they want to use, they decide to keep him. Smith and Jackson, both young, both less than 23 years old. Um, you know, if they like one of them better than the other, perhaps they keep the other one. Or what you could do is just say, whichever one we feel like we get the best offer for, not necessarily like compared to each other, but compared to the value they place on those players, that's the one you move. And then you move forward with the pieces you get in exchange. That's a fine way of thinking. But I think in general, that seems like the position where something almost has to be sorted out because they're not you it's just poor asset usage right now to have that many bigs especially when they can't play nearly all of them even in one game it's very hard to get all of them out there it's very hard to get more than two of them out there as it stands so that will be my biggest storyline is is can they find a way to sort that out and if not is there you know a wave coming a buyout for Batadze maybe you know is something else coming to to sort that out post deadline we'll see that's number 1 for me uh the other the second thing i want to talk about in this in this part of uh, the segment is, do the Pacers keep their draft picks, right? I think that's another interesting thing to look out for as we approach the deadline. Again, it's tomorrow at 3 p.m. Is the draft pick situation for the Pacers? I've harped on it a lot, but if you just look at the Pacers draft situation this coming draft, their own pick, which is currently 7th or 8th right now, uh, the Cavs pick, which is currently 26th, the Celtics pick, which is currently 30th, and then the second rounder they have coming in from someone, TBD, based on records. I'll explain that in a later show. That's four draft picks. Let's look at the Pacers roster. They have three players on expiring contracts. That's O'Shea Brissett, Terry Taylor. Excuse me, not Terry Taylor. O'Shea Brissett, James Johnson, and Goga Batadze, right? Uh, there are the two-way slots. Kendall Brown and Traveling Queen are technically both expiring, but you can't put a first-round pick in a two-way slot. The 31st pick, if it's the Houston if it, the second rounder becomes from Houston, is not going to take a two-way. Like There are a lot of factors that say they literally can't make that many picks to fill the spots in their team as of right now. And Pritchard even said that in our little media session with him. He said, I don't, at the end of the day, think we add four rookies, right? So they don't have to do that, this stuff now. And in fact, a lot of stuff that, that's talked about for the Pacers at the trade deadline will still be relevant trade conversations around June, at before the draft, before this league year ends on June 30th. But do they trade some of those picks now, consolidate them for a player, a future pick, something like that, because they don't have room to add them right now. And even if they had the literal roster room to add those players, the rotational space, the minutes allocation, the development opportunities aren't even there, right? They already have a lot of young guys playing right now with, you know, Halliburton, Neesmith, Nembard, Matherin, um, whatever backup big plays that day, Duarte, like they have a lot of young guys, developing guys in the mix for minutes already. It's really hard to fit more of them in, especially if Tyrese Halliburton's an all-star and you're going to end up being a good team next year. It's really challenging. And so the, again, this isn't something they have to do right now. This is something they could easily do in June to sort this out. Um, maybe they want future picks instead. Maybe they want a, a higher impact player. Maybe they want to consolidate two picks for one better pick, but it's hard to know what's a better pick right the second, right? There's a lot up floating in the air with that, especially without knowing what their second round pick incoming in the, is going to be. But uh, I wouldn't be surprised if, if a pick is involved in a trade the Pacers make just because they have too many, right? Given their team situation, they just have too many. So Pritchard saying that himself, I think was, was, good for me to hear because I'd long thought that. So now it's at least <laughs> coming from them. Um, and now it'll be care. I'll be curious if at this junction of team building, if they try to do it now, or if it makes more sense to do it at the draft, when all of those pick spots are known and they can figure out the best way to use them, but it's possible, especially if they can see a long-term upgrade, they could acquire right now, but they end up using some of those to do it. I think that storyline number two beyond the backup bigs is how can they, use their draft capital to shift around their team in a way that makes more sense because they're, they're still in a very early stage of the rebuild. Like I know a lot of fans are talking about wanting to know the team's direction, what they're going to do with the deadline, how it's all going to be sorted out. Like they just started with this team in this, the, the first game of the era of this team was in October. That was four months ago, right? Like there's a lot of time coming for this group. There's no rush for the Pacers. We'll see how it all sorts out. And there's a lot more storylines I want to cover in the second segment, cap space, actions and words, some guards that I want to talk about. We will get to those in just a moment. A lot of interesting 
money move ideas that could be coming for the Pacers. Before we talk about those, though, let me talk to you guys about Built Bar. Looking for a delicious treat but don't want all the fat and calories? Then you have to try a Built Bar. We just got through the holidays. My goal is to eat a little healthier this year if you're like me. We're going to eat healthier but don't want to compromise taste. And that is where Built Bar comes in. It's healthy and actually tasty. They're so delicious. They'll help you with a New Year's resolution. That's what makes them so good. They are 100% covered in real chocolate on the protein bar with real chocolate. And they come in unbelievable flavors like coconut almond, churro, and my favorite peanut butter brownie. I'm not sure how they do it, but they taste like a candy bar while maintaining awesome healthy macros, 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, 17 grams of protein. And you don't have to wait around to get a box now by ordering them. We've talked about going to built.com before. Now you can get them at Walmart or Sam's Club. That's right. Head to your Walmart today. You can get a four box of the cookies and cream, the double chocolate, or the coconut puffs. You can go to Sam's Club and get a 13 bar box with some of their hit flavors like brownie batter and churro. Thank me later. Check them out. Built.com, Walmart, or Sam's Club. Built Bar. Try one today. Thank you, as always, for making Locked On Pacers your first listen today and every single day. For your second listen, hop on over to Locked On Kings. We'll talk about, they, they can talk about Matt George. The second NBA trade of this deadline cycle, there was a couple. Uh, the trades are starting, sort of. Uh, they were all minor today. Um, the Nets traded Kessler Edwards and Cash to the Kings as a money-saving move. And Dwayne Dedman went from the Heat, who the Pacers played tonight, uh, to the Spurs using a second round pick in a money dumping move. And that is a great segue for me to talk about the Pacers and money dumping moves. Money dumping moves are happening now. So teams can set themselves up for future moves, know their situation, stuff like that. Those, the team that is dumping the money wants to do that as early as possible. The team taking in the money usually wants to do it as late as possible so they can use their resources in as many ways as they can. So it's a tough push and pull either way. Some of those trades have already happened, and the Pacers are in an interesting spot because even though they renegotiated and extended Miles Turner's contract, they still have some cap space to play with. They have somewhere between eight and nine million in space right now, and they have Lance Stevenson's cap hold in the books. If they just yank that away, they can get between 10 and 11 million in cap space right now. That allows you to do some pretty interesting things flexibility wise, right? And every team's looking to save some money, but especially this year for a couple reasons. One, the tax bill that is distributed to the other teams from the tax paying teams is pretty huge. It's going to be pretty large between the Lakers and the Warriors and the Nets and the Clippers. And there are other teams in the tax, but those are the huge ones that return to teams will be huge. Um, and also just um, getting under the tax in a competitive year like this, when there's some teams so close, that's likely to play a factor as well. So the savings are important. Every dollar is important. There's ownership changes that happened today, right? There's a lot that could go on. And John Hollinger did a good job in his trade deadline piece that he just put out, you know, talking about following the money in which teams could, in theory, make a money related deal. The Suns being one of them, they just got Matt Ishbia to buy their team. Uh, and they are a team that is well into the tax right now. And they're, they're good. They have title hopes, but like, Dario Saric makes, you know, 10 plus million for them. Landry Shamit makes 10 plus million for them. You know, those are two guys that in the right trade, the Suns could just take in. They'd have to send out some money if a Shamit, in a Shamit deal, probably a Saric deal too, but they could save the Suns in salary plus tax money, like double digit millions of dollars. And in exchange, the Pacers could get draft picks, cash, something that makes it worth it for them to do it. And that's always a good idea if you have the space to do it now. This is something that I have to talk about. I just did this with the picks. You, you, your cap space lasts the whole league season. So if the Pacers don't bring in any money right now, they could have cap space to take in money on a draft night trade that happens in this league year in June. The trade doesn't have to happen in July. So it's not like if they don't use it now, it's just gone forever. There's no more options, right? They could still use it in the future and future trades or future signings, whatever. But if the offer is there now or you're getting an asset you like, they could do it. So the Suns, for example, have some money that could be moved. The Warriors tax bill is going to be a jillion, gajillion dollars. If they could shed anybody, maybe they would want to do it. I'm reading through Hollinger's list, but the, the teams that I identified first when I did this project with somebody else were the Suns, uh, the 76ers. They're really close to the tax line. They have some like kind of interesting young pieces like Furkan Korkmaz just demanded a trade, for example. Like The Pacers could take him in with a small asset. And there's a lot of teams like that. The Nets already made their money jumping move. So there's more. The Clippers, for example, but they they seem to be fine spending. Uh, the Bucks are way in. Maybe, you know, Serge Ibaka, George Hill could be guys that the Pacers scoop up and get an asset with. I, I could go on and on telling you about the options. I think the 76ers, um, now that the Heat made their move, the Heat were probably the most likely. But the 76ers are 
pretty likely to make a small money dumping trade. Perhaps they could be a, a fit here with the Pacers. I think the Suns make some sense. So uh, we'll see where this ends up going. But because the Pacers have enough space to take in a decent salary, not a big one, but a decent one that, you know, when combined with the tax penalty, saves the other team a ton of money, an absolute ton of money. Like the Kessler Edwards trade that the Nets did today. They trade Kessler Edwards in cash to the Kings and they, they, save like eight to ten million dollars but they only have to send out way less than that in cash right it pays for itself and the kings get cash in a player that they might be interested in you know these these kind of win wins are out there all the time if you're willing to take in something so the pacers could consider that if it's a draft pick especially if it's a good draft pick uh and a player into their space they'd have to send out a player they take in a player because their roster size is full so there would be some negotiating that would have to go on but that's one thing I'll be curious about storyline wise is do the Pacers use their cap space now? Do they save it for the draft? Using as much of it as you can is generally beneficial if your owner is on board to spend as much as possible because then you can extract it for the most assets you possibly can. So that's another thing I'll be watching out for this deadline. Um, look, the wing guard discussion, I wrote this down as a topic because Chris Duarte just got a coach's decision, did not play. Buddy Heald, Shams Trani reported teams were interested in him. Uh, around Christmas, I think it was included in his Miles Turner <laughs> renegotiation report, ironically. Could either of those two guys be on the move? Because it seems like the rest of the Pacers guards in the mix, you know, McConnell, Halliburton, Matherin, you know, those guys, Neesmith, whatever, <laughs> whatever, whoever else you consider a guard will not be on the move. They're part of the Pacers core long-term planning. Healed, the, the idea would be selling high, even though he fits very well with the Pacers and their culture. I don't know if I would or wouldn't do it. It would depend on the offer. Duarte, I have said on the show that I don't think I would trade if I was the Pacers right now because you're trading him when his value is at its lowest. I don't think if you moved him, if you if they ride it out with Duarte the rest of the season, it still feels like he doesn't fit, then it's not like his value is going to be lower in the summer. So I think I would not move any guard wing types of guys for the Pacers, but I'll be curious what they do or consider doing with Hilder Duarte. If they do move one of their guard wing whatever types i think those would be the two most likely for it to happen uh because of you know duarte's fit and down year and um again selling high on healed even though he would fit very well on several contenders so i'll be curious if either of those guys get moved i i wouldn't bet on it you know rick carlisle's exact quote uh about trades let me scroll up in the article um I wrote a lot of quotes. So I have to make sure I'm in the right spot. Rick Carlisle said on uh, before Sunday's game, if you're asking me if I anticipate anything happening, uh, I always say it's very doubtful. That was his quote on the trade deadline. So we'll see what ends up happening. But I would keep my eye on those two guys as I run through the storylines. And the last one is the Pacers' actions versus their words. Look, I don't want to – actions always speak louder than words. You can say you're doing one thing and then do the other. But the Pacers' words have been – there's a long-term approach. The moves they've made since saying that even suggest that with the renegotiation and extension of Turner, with the way they've prioritized flexibility, with the way that they've kind of structured their team and rotation. It's an, it, I agree that they have gone to a long-term thinking plan, but I understand also the tricky part if you're them and you have an owner who likes winning and has gone on the record in past seasons of saying he likes winning and building on the go. Sure, you can convince him that a long-term approach makes sense, but as soon as the wins start coming, I get that it could be tricky for the Pacers to kind of be, you know, be be interested in trying to get better. And and they could still do that as long as it makes sense long-term. I think it would make sense, but it's going to be a tricky act. And this is kind of what my Forbes piece is about, of finding the right line of towing, you know, uh, the long-term approach and and the, the dangling carrot in front of you of success that they had to start the season, right? Pritchard even said to us, I'm surprised at what I'm saying today compared to what I thought I was going to be saying today five months ago because I'm so bullish on our players. I'm so bullish on our coaches. And then he said, we're here right now. It's way faster than we anticipated. Except the extra said it's way faster than we anticipated. First some emphasis there. So um, I'll just be curious what they ultimately end up doing. Storyline-wise, we'll learn a lot about what the Pacers front office and organization in general thinks of, where they are, where they're headed, and how fast they can get to their ultimate goal, right? If they kind of go for it, I think they'll think that they have, you know, a good chance to win series pretty soon. 
And if they you know, make some minor moves to continue to evaluate their young guys and make a bigger splash in the summer, I think they think they're maybe a little farther away. They're 10th in the East right now. I understand their strong start. They still have a good record when Halliburton plays. So there's some good merit to a lot of directions. And it's not to say that they're going to do something stupid or bad. I just think we're going to learn a lot about what they actually think with the moves they make compared to what they say. But what they're saying still makes the most sense to me is what they should do. And I think they've said the right things basically the whole time since the start of last season, right? Pritchard did say, I don't want to say we're going to quick grow this thing because I don't know. And so I'm looking forward to seeing what actually happens, mostly because I hate the trade deadline and I feel like I'm bothering everyone on the planet with my many texts that I've sent out this week trying to figure out what all is going on. We'll actually get to find out Wednesday and Thursday as this all wraps up. We're five NBA trades at the time of me recording this, which is 9.30 p.m. on the 7th, trying to get it done before LeBron plays, just in case. Um, But we'll see how things go in the next couple days. Let's talk some heat to get out of here. Pacers last game before the deadline in Miami, where they just had a thrilling win uh, a little over a month ago before Christmas Halliburton's Uh, I would say seminal game of his career so far. Can the Pacers repeat that? What do they need to do well? And will we learn anything about trades from this game? They played the Hawks in a weird one last year right before the deadline. Let's talk about that before you guys get out of here. But before we do that, let me talk to you guys about prize picks. For example, do you think LeBron James tonight is going to score more or less than that 35 and a half number he would have to get to exceed Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's total. You think Steph Curry will make more or less than four and a half threes in a given game? That's the gist of prize picks. You pick two to six players, and if they'll score more or less than their prize picks projections, you can up to 25 times your money on any entry. It's not you against other people, which is the daunting part of a lot of other ways to play daily fantasy sports. It's just you versus the projections available. That's what makes it so fun to me. It's you versus their projections. And you can they offer projections on any sport you watch, NBA, NFL, MLB, college sports. You can make your entries in 60 seconds or less. It's super easy. It's safe. There's fast withdrawals, and it's operational in over 30 states, plus Canada. Try it yourself. Download the PricePix app or go to PricePix.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports first-time users. You can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with the promo code locked on. If you deposit $100, they'll give you $100. You deposit $50, they'll give you $50. You get the gist. Check it out today, prizepicks.com. Prize picks is daily fantasy made easy. Thank you, as always, for making Locked On Pacers your first listen today and every single day. For your second listen, check out Locked On Heat. One, the Pacers play them tonight. Two, they just made one of the first trades of this week. Obviously, the Kyrie Irving trade was bigger, uh, but this one's still significant in the way that it sets the market for various things like salary dumps, like the Heat's roster situation, etc., Etc. The last game before the trade deadline is always funny. Remember last year, the Pacers played in Atlanta. They just traded Sabonis. Sabonis didn't play in that game, obviously. They played eight guys because half their team, not half, a couple guys were in COVID protocols. They had Reggie Perry because they had guys on COVID protocols. But then one of the guys that traded away, I want to say it was Jeremy Lamb, got out of COVID protocols, but they weren't going to play him because he was in the trade. So Reggie Perry wasn't actually allowed to play. So they only had eight available players. One of them was Torrey Craig, who if he had gotten hurt, who knows what happens because they ended up trading him the very next day to the Suns. We actually saw Torrey Craig practicing the next day. So I didn't know if he did or did not get moved. It was, (laughs) it's crazy how these games the day befores go. I talked a little bit in my rotation segment on Monday show about guys getting did not plays or guys sitting out for injuries. This is the only day where that can kind of be interesting or meaningful of the season to me is this Wednesday before. Yeah, it can sort of mean something leading up to it, but not really either way. That game can always be fun and interesting. The heat just signed a guy to a 10, 10 day contract. I have no idea what's going on. So there's could be a lot of just funkiness in this game and the injury report kind of big, right? Chris Duarte's ankle thing that kept him out on Sunday. He's still questionable. Nikola Jovic is out. Kyle Lowry's out. Oladipo's out. Um, Omer Yurtsevin's out. Like, the Heat are kind of hobbled, but they've been playing good basketball. So, on the actual court, I can't leave it. I get to talk about a little bit of actual basketball for a second during trade deadline week. The Heat are are playing pretty well right now. Uh, They lost their last two, but before that, they had won, I think it was seven out of nine. They're back up to six in the East. They look a little bit more like the Miami Heat, for lack of a better term. A team that just kicks your butt with their strong defense every single night. Eric Spolstra, a G- I, I'm out of words for Spo on defense. Like He can just throw stuff at you, and some of it's the, the personnel they have allows him to be clever. They've been, they've been the best team, I think, at consistently slowing the Pacers. They had that game where they held them to 82 points. Tyrese Halberton's message a lot about that game was the second the Heat would shoot, 
backpedal on defense. They don't care about the offensive rebound. They don't want the Pacers to run in transition. That's when the Pacers are at their best, when they're trying to play fast and get out and run. And it worked. Even the game in December, where the Pacers' offense looked pretty good and ended up winning, they only scored 111. That's not like that much in the modern NBA. The Heat's defense is crazy good. It's fourth in the league this season, which is it's hard to have a really good defense when you're playing in transition so much because your offense kind of stinks 27th in offense. That wide gap is pretty rare, and yet here the Heat are with Eric Spolster on their team. They're a tough nut to crack, and so the Pacers will have to do what they did earlier in the seasons when they beat the Heat. They have to shoot well from deep. <laughs> That's a very key thing against this Heat team to spread them out, to make them react to you. You have to be shooting well. It's always very boring to just say you have to shoot well to beat a good defense. Duh, you have to make shots to win basketball games, but especially so against the Heat, right? When they scored a 111, 111, again, that's not a high number. That required 21 made threes in Miami to take to 111. The Pacers went 21 of 47 that night to pull that off. And obviously a big part of that was Tyrese Halberton setting the Pacers franchise record, making 10 threes himself, including, the again, the seminal moment of his career to date, the game winner over Tyler Hero, his Oshkosh native uh, friend in the league, Kyle Lowry and him miscommunication. I don't know what happened. Either way, a huge shot, a big moment but also kind of underscores what's required to beat the Heat is really good shooting nights, right? And they didn't just get it from him. Buddy Heald had seven in that game. Buddy Heald and Tyrese Halberton combined, just those two guys, made four more threes than the Heat, and the Pacers still needed the final possession to win the game, right? Shooting is going to be huge if the Pacers shoot average or worse from three in this game. I just don't think they have much of a chance because the Heat's defense has shown that they know the blueprint to beat the Pacers and is tough to, for anyone to crack, not even a Pacers offense that ranks you know, slightly below league average this season. So it would be before you get into any sort of matchup or dive into what the Heat are and aren't good at, if the Pacers can't shoot well, they do not have much of a chance against a team with Bam Adebayo and Jimmy Butler, which the thing about the Heat beyond their defense is it's not that intimidating of a team. It's a really interesting squad this year, right? By According to their net rating, they're basically average. Their net rating expected win loss is 27 and 27, right? It's not that good. It's not that impressive. The Pacers have beaten them twice for a reason, and it's be beyond the shooting things I just said because the Heat's offense really stinks, right? They take an eh amount of threes per game. They make the 27th highest percentage of their threes. They make the 21st highest percentage of their two-pointers. They, they take the 25th most free throws per game in the league. Those are all poor numbers. They don't get up a lot of efficient shots. They don't make a lot of efficient shots. They're good at making free throws. They're good at taking threes, but that combo doesn't work perfectly in tandem all the time so they're really reliant on steals transition things like that right they turn the other team over the third most in the league they don't block shots that much they get stops instead they're you know that's kind of what they want to do and they're not a good rebounding team either right it's just a strange sort of statistical profile for a team the heat turn it over a decent amount and they're not that efficient but they force a lot of turnovers and they're good in transition that's a weird way to play but free throws transition that's sort of their bread and butter so if you're the pacers What's key? Tyrese Halliburton. <laughs> Tyrese Halliburton is key. If he can shoot well, if he can take care of the ball like he did last time they won in South Beach. But in general, that sort of game where his assists outweigh his turnovers by a significant amount, where he's shooting the ball well from deep, that bends the heat defense enough that the other guys can have good games. He's massively important in this game. Defending without fouling, super significant against Miami, who again is, is fantastic at the foul line, at getting there and at finishing there. And they are creative on offense. They just don't necessarily have guys who have like oomph to score outside of Bam necessarily. Jimmy does, but a lot of that's getting to the foul line. So not fouling will be huge because matchup to matchup at yeah, Bam's better than Turner, certainly. And Jimmy Butler's better than Aaron Neesmith, certainly. But the Pacers win a lot of the other individual matchups. And that's not a good way to look at comparing teams. But when it's like super significant, one team over the other, the Pacers have ways to create advantages, especially with their second unit, especially with a guy like TJ McConnell, who can kind of probe and at least sort of make the Heat defense move around. But it's important that the Pacers don't foul. It's important that they play good transition defense. And it's important that at least one, but I would say two of their shooters, make their threes against this Miami defense. We'll talk about what actually happens on this show tomorrow. We'll see where the segment order takes us. But we'll talk Pacers Heat tomorrow. Did the Pacers get a win? Are they back a little bit more on track going two and twos in Talbert and Turner? Do they still have kinks to work out? We'll talk about that tomorrow, plus the latest in trade land. If there's any trades that impact the Pacers, we'll talk about that. If there's not, I'll just share my final trade deadline thoughts heading into it. Players that I think should or shouldn't be moved. Maybe I'll be a little more opinionated on the last day that it actually matters. We'll talk about trade stuff. And, of course, uh, on Thursday's day tomorrow, 
if there is a trade made by the Pacers, I'll give you a short 15 to 20 minute podcast, breaking it down, instant reaction, the next steps. And then the next show will be the longer form. Here's all the things that happened. Here's all the details. Here's what you need to know. What does it mean for everybody else? Ripple effects, you know, all the usual use the Turner podcast order layout as a good way of doing it. The breaking news podcast was first. The why they did it was second. The ripple effects was third. That's sort of the blueprint we'll follow with any trades the Pacers make. So stay tuned. Locked on Pacers. We'll have you covered for all of that here this week. Thank you guys a ton for listening. Hope you're enjoying Trade Deadline Week. If that's something you enjoy, I'm on Twitter at T East NBA. This show is on Twitter at Locked on Pacers. Thank you guys so much for listening. You're on the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every single day. We will see you tomorrow.